you guys. Happy Friday. This is going to be a really informal talk. I'm coming to you guys from home. I have kids home. I have the dog around and I basically just have my notes in front of me. I wanted to share a little bit with you guys about a continuing education course that I'm taking. It's a, this is a three part course right now put together by three physical therapists who are pretty well-renowned, well-known authors and researchers in our profession. And all of them have significant experience working with runners. So the course is called um, Decoding Running. The first part, it's a, again, three-part course. The first part was by Jay Dicherry, who wrote the book Running Rewired. And many of you guys have heard me talk about that. That book is change the way we look at our runners when we screen them for our injury prevention. And he most, most recently had an upcoming, um, oh, he revised the book basically. So that's on my to-do list to get that. Um, so that was part one, um, about halfway through that lecture and I need to watch the rest of that one. The second one was um, by a gentleman named Nathan something or other. Uh, and his topic was on bone stress injuries. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you guys a little bit about today. The third part um, was supposed to be June 1st, but it got rescheduled to June, um, June 29th. And that's, I think, more of a case study about a high level, like collegiate or elite athlete with a bone stress injury. So I just wanna spend a few minutes talking about bone stress injuries. So stress reactions, stress fractures. Um, it has kind of been plaguing Raven and I, that might not be the right word, but in the past year and a half that Raven has been working with me, you guys know we have, we see a high number of runners, um, not just local Chardon runners, but local area runners. And it is, early as last year, it was disturbing enough to Raven, and she, she could probably tell you she did the stats, um, the incident rate of fracture just in our Chardon High School team was way off the average of what research shows stress reaction injuries to be. So what, what is going on and why are these kids fracturing when it doesn't appear to always be too much, too fast, too soon, which is a very common reason for like shin splints, right? Too much, too fast, too soon. A shin splint is the very early beginning stages of um, warning sign that something's going on in that tibia. So wh what is going on? And so on this course, um, I did kind of ask that question. I said, it really does seem like recently the rate of bone stress injuries in our runners is increasing. Is anybody else seeing that? And he agreed, had just sort of his own personal um, experience that since COVID, the rate of these bone stress injuries seems to be increased. I'm not sure why, but it's not just local here to Chardon. <laughs> so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the takeaways that I'm learning. And so for those of you that have runners in the group, or if you are a runner, some things to maybe take away as action items for you. Uh, your, your skeleton, your bones are designed to take a bunch of load. So what, what is going on, you know, with, with our skeleton and why, you know, why is it developing a problem? So the goal of, for any runner or for, you know, for any athlete is we want to increase the resistance to fracture. We don't want this to happen. We want to increase the size of the bone. We want to increase the mineralization of the bone, the microarchitecture of the bone, and then the bone density so that when we subject it to load, it can tolerate it. Well, one of the things that is definitely researched and evidence-based is that our bone density is strengthened largely before puberty when we're kids. And one of the best things that you can do for your children when they are little is impose, is impose? <laughs> what is the word? Subject them to, put them in multi-directional 
high activity sports. So think running, jumping, cutting, soccer, football, basketball, baseball, karate, swimming. Mm, swimming's not weight bearing, but multi-directional high activity sports when we are kids builds the best bones moving forward and research shows that those children who did that had stronger bones later on and i think particularly one of the problems that we're seeing with society as a whole right now is the push to have our young children specialize from very early on and we are seeing kids pushed into choosing the one sport that they're going to do for the rest of their life if they are ever going to possibly make the high school team they have to be on a club team from the time that they're five and we're seeing kids instead of being allowed to be a three sport athlete which many kids did for years which builds stronger bones we're putting our kid in one sport and they're doing it three seasons or four seasons of the year and that is doing a disservice and possibly why we're seeing an increased risk of bone stress injuries um, moving into the teenage and, and um, young adult years. So that's just a, a little personal word of encouragement or caution for those of you with children. Put your kids in multi-sport athletes, uh, sports, multi-directional sports when they're little to build stronger bones. Um, one of the platforms that this gentleman stood on was that it's uh, this is a your body is a system this is multifaceted so we're seeing these injuries even in elite athletes who have smart coaches who watch how much they train and for generally <laughs> we have a collegiate athlete sometimes we question um, the respect of rest and healing but by and large, even you know, people that are doing all of the right things with all of the right coaching are still getting bone stress injuries. One of the other times in a person's life that the bone stress injuries could be come so high is when these young children go off to college. And the thought about that is, you know, look at what's happening in that kid's life at that time. So they're away from home, um, living independently maybe for the first time, probably for the first time in charge of their own nutrition or at the um, mercy of the food that the school provides for them and in a situation of life stress being high which taxes the body with um, maybe possibly nutritional deficiencies and then high mileage that goes along with being a collegiate runner we're seeing the breakdown in in their bones so you you really need to look at the whole person and how you're managing your stress and that sort of thing you think about even my high school boys who um, know that they should eat you know protein and carbohydrates for breakfast and same thing for lunch or really i think by and large our student athletes they're not fueling their bodies well for health and a um, couple couple general recommendations number one um, the recommendation is for every 10 miles that you are going going to run a week your body needs an additional 100 calories above your like baseline caloric need to just live to supply yourself with the nutrients that that you need every runner really uh, quite possibly should consult with a dietitian or somebody that knows how to help them make sure that they are fueling their body for health but especially at the higher levels a lot of the colleges have dietitians that are attached to their to their schools so but for the general running population if you want to make sure you're fueling your body for health it's for every 10 miles a week you're going to run you need an extra 100 calories of nutrient dense food to to fuel your body so and the reason that i'm stressing so much about nutrition is because this gentleman definitely had you know sort of research to back up there's something called reds um i always forget what it stands for but it's basically um nutritional deficiency in runners. It's a huge problem. Um, it can be a problem in, in female runners. It's evidenced by lack of cycles. They're, they lose their um, menstrual cycle. The menstrual cycle is the sign of 
female health. Um, there are also um, things to watch for in your male runners because their sex hormones are just a little bit different. So if a, if a male athlete is, is being malnourished, not having enough <coughs> nutrients to fuel them, then their um, morning erections would be affected. Their um, sex drive, if they're sexually active, would, active would be affected. And for the female, it's gonna be the loss of her cycle. And when your female and male sex hormones are affected, that affects bone density. And I know for sure with the female, when she becomes amenorrheic for a long period of time, you get loss of bone density in that female runner. And that is a very, very serious problem. So REDS is a legitimate, serious concern. And it feeds into the point that I'm trying to make is, what I'm learning is that bone stress injuries are to be considered a fueling issue until proven otherwise. So there's a lot of things that it could be. It could be a training issue. Um, it could be a biomechanical issue. It could be a volume issue. But research more and more is showing that it it's to be considered a fueling issue until proven otherwise. And so just some really, um, unless I don't know how many running geeks in here are going to appreciate what I'm sharing with you guys, but really, really interesting for, for me to learn. The other thing that I want some of you guys to hear is that there are um, there is a tendency sometimes for young people to go uh, again seek um, medical a doctor before coming to physical therapy for assessment of pain that they're having that often results in an image and the image can be helpful because the image does help us determine location and intensity it is absolutely necessary for some of the more serious bone stress injuries um, but one of the things that can happen is that um, we're seeing a lot of patients put in boots and unloading a bone stress in injury is at times appropriate and necessary at other times it can be harmful there are two types of um, bone stress injuries, we categorize them as high risk and low risk. A high risk bone injury is in a location that doesn't have good vasculature or blood flow. And when you have a bone stress injury in one of these locations, you will be non weight bearing for a minimum of six weeks to make sure that there is healing. The location of the high risk bone stress injuries are the neck of the femur, which is the long bone in your leg, the inside ankle bone, your medial malleolus, your talus, which is an ankle bone, the navicular, which is a little bone on the inside of your arch, your fifth proximal metatarsal, which is the little bone on the outside of your foot, close to the ankle up here, the base of the second metatarsal, which is your second toe here, and uh, the sesamoid bone in your great toe. Those locations, if you have a stress, bone stress injury, especially um, as evidenced on an image, you will be non-weight bearing uh, for a period of time. Um, they don't have good blood flow and they have uh, an increased rate or decreased rate of healing. There are, however, a very, very high number of low stress, um, low risk bone stress reactions. They have good blood flow, they they heal well and they generally do not require a period of non-weight bearing. The location for the low stress injuries are um, the tibia, posterior medial tibia, very common location for the shin splint um, or stress reaction, which can become a stress fracture. The outside of the ankle, the fibula head or the ma lateral malleoli, the shaft of the femur, so not the, not this is your leg, your femur, there's a, the neck of your femur would be like this little bone here and then the ball of your femur up here. So if you injure this part of your femur, you're, um, you're unloaded. But if it's the long bone of your femur, then you don't have to be. Your pelvis, your heel, your calcaneus, um, and then the middle part of your, your feet, the second through fourth rays. And what I can tell you from personal experience is that um, when we put athletes in a boot who have a stress reaction in a low risk site, you get bone deterioration 
progressively and generally proportional to the degree of partial weight bearing. So you're doing a disservice to the bone density of the runner by putting by unloading them because you are progressively um, deteriorating the bone. And the other thing that happens with the tibia, when you have a tibial stress reaction and you put the person in a boot, you get loss of bone distal to that. So you're gonna, you're gonna weaken the bones of the foot, basically. And so um, just another reason that you want to make sure you're seeing somebody for these issues who's staying up on the research, who understands the risk associated with the treatment that's being recommended, and hopefully um, you will consider you know, continuing to use Fit for Life to be your go-to people for your running-related injuries and life-related injuries um, because the goal needs to be keeping the patients moving as much as possible, um, building bone density and getting them back to activity as soon as possible. So that is my soapbox on bone stress-related injuries today. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to comment them below and go uh, have a wonderful weekend. The last thing I will say is I shared the link for the Superhero 5K that we are sponsoring. Uh, we're really hoping that a ton of you guys from our Fit for Life family will come and do the run. Whether you run it or you walk it, um, it's one registration for the 5K. There's not a one mile walk being promoted. We're just encouraging our patients to sign up for the run come dressed as your favorite superhero, which should be fun. And uh, we're gonna have a ton of fun at that event. So we're hoping uh, many of you guys will join us. Okay, have a great weekend and I will talk to you guys. Thanks for listening. If you listened all the way to the end, you're a winner. Thank you.